Hello everybody and welcome to this week's Walking Together. This is the third of our studies in the book of Esther and this week we're going to consider what is probably the best known phrase from the whole book when Mordecai says to Esther, who knows if perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this. Just it reminds her of her destiny and the background to this is Esther is the queen Mordecai is both her cousin and her guardian. And at this point, the whole of the Jewish nation is under threat of annihilation because of a plot by the wicked Haman. Mordecai challenges Esther to go and plead with the king for her people. And she says, if I go before the king uninvited, I will die. The law was that you couldn't go before the king uninvited, um, whether that was to stop rivals causing problems, whether it was to stop queens and concubines coming together, or whether it was just that the king liked some order, I don't know, but you couldn't just wander in willy-nilly. The only exception was if you walked in and the king extended his scepter to you, you would be allowed to live. So this was Esther's response. I can't go before the king I will, I will die. And she says, I've not been called in for 30 days. And it must have mattered to her because she's counted. It's been 30 days. What's going on here? Maybe the king doesn't want me. Maybe the king doesn't like me. So she's already got these sorts of issues probably already going on in her head. But I'm going to read. I'm going to read from Esther chapter 4, verses 13 to 16. And I'm going to read from the New Living. Mordecai sent this reply to Esther. Don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace, you will escape when all the Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will come from some other place, but you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this? Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go and gather together all the Jews of Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will do the same. And then, though it is against the law, I will go to see the king. If I must die, I must die. I love the fact that she doesn't just hurtle in. You know, quite often if I've made a decision, shumph, I'm gone. Um, you know, or sometimes we hang back and hang back because we're not sure, we're not sure. We want all the details we want. But she makes a clear Three days, and then I will see the king. Then I will go and I will talk to him. So she goes and she sees the king. But even then, she doesn't blurt it all out. It's on the second time that she's with him. And as we've considered the last couple of weeks, in the meantime, God has disarmed things. God has prepared things. And she's had the sensitivity to go step by step with God through all of it. One thing that was outside of her control in many ways was at the time of this fast, they were celebrating Passover. As we look at the dates in the book of Esther and the time of the year, it was the time when they celebrated Passover. And Passover was part of the, celebrating the deliverance from Egypt. When the angel of death passed over and God rescued all those that were obedient and you know, God rescued just those that trusted in him. And so it was a, a, a feast and a festival, Passover. So she would go into this time knowing, having it in the forefront of her mind that God had already miraculously delivered his people. And that testimony of God's faithfulness would hopefully be there in her mind. I think that's, it's not chance. And I think that's just wonderful. She could have responded, I'm out of my depth. She could have said, nobody will listen to me. She could have said, the king's fed up with me. He's not even called me for 30 days. What's the point? What's the point? You know, all, all kinds of things. But she doesn't. She's obedient. And God is good. Mordecai also, he knows how to choose his battles. We've already considered how when he was ordered to bow to the wicked Haman, he refused. Even when it got really tough and might cause problems for a lot of other people, as well as himself, he refused to bow. But he could have also fought. 
when people came to collect Hester because the way that she became queen was the previous queen had been deposed for refusing to parade herself in front of the king's mates. And when the king wanted a new queen, they went and gathered all the beautiful virgins from the whole kingdom. And when they came to Mordecai's house, he could have said, you're not having my my beautiful cousin. He could have said, it's against our law. She can't marry you. You're a pagan. She needs a good Jewish husband to raise good Jewish children. And he could have got his sword out and he could have lost everything. Sometimes what seems right in our eyes isn't right. And sometimes we can stand and fight at the wrong time. But he knew the battles that he should fight and the battles that he shouldn't fight. And he also says to Esther, if you stay quiet at this time, God will do things in another way. And sometimes we don't know when to speak and when to be quiet. And that's part of our maturing in God. I have a friend called Mary, a lovely friend called Mary, and she has a sensitivity in in timing. And she always rings me at just the right time. And then I turned up in Ireland, which is where she lives. She didn't even know that I was in the country. And as I arrive in the town, immediately Mary walks up to me. Just because of that sensitivity and flexibility. And some of us, we take the easy route and we don't speak up. Or others of us, probably more my tendency is we put our mouth into gear before our brain or before we've listened to God. But she had to speak up. It was time for her to speak. But she spoke with wisdom at the right time. And it had the right effect. She could have said, I can't change things. But she did her part and she trusted God to do his part. We can try and do it all. We can think it all depends on us. And we end up flat on our face. Or we can refuse to play our part. And God has to find another avenue, another way of working out his plans. The book of Ezra, the events of the book of Ezra were 30 years before this, and lots of people had gone back to Israel. But they were still there. And some people should have, could have said, that's wrong, why are you still there? They might have thought, why are we still here? But they were in the right place for the right time. You might not understand why you are where you are. You might not understand why things haven't changed, but there is a right time in God. And there is no chance about where you live and about where you are and who surrounds you. God is at work, even when we don't see, even when we don't understand, he is at work. We might have messed up in the past, Maybe she'd messed up in the past, but we need to just say, I'm sorry, and not allow it to hold us back from trusting God again. Um, Corrie Ten Boom says, um, hang on, where have I put it? Oh, that's it. Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. We might not know why we are where we are, but he does. And we might not know what's coming, but he does. And he is still able to work all things together for good, even in your life. He knows where you are and he knows why. Haman, when he went to the king to ask permission to wipe out the Jews, he just said there are those people, a certain people. But Esther When she went to the king, she said, those are my people. She'd been obedient to Mordecai and not revealed who she was. She hadn't revealed her nationality. That was a time when she was obedient and kept quiet. But now she stands up and she speaks up and she says, those are my people. And not just this nation, that name, they are my people. And we're much more likely to stand when it's through love. Love brings a courage. Love brings a willingness that principles and politics just don't bring. And she stood there for her people. And Mordecai stuck out his neck for his people. Some of you know Sid and his wife and his team. And they lead a charity called Embassy Village. 
and they're hoping to start, well, they're planning to start building very soon. But they need, between now and the end of February, £800,000. That must feel so vulnerable. And sometimes the things that God requires us to do seem so big, like going before a king or sticking your neck out when you've not got the money, when you've not got the strength, when you've not got the wisdom. Pray for Sid. And if you've got (laughs) £800,000, pray for Sid. But sometimes God takes us out beyond our depth to where we don't see and we don't understand. And it's so beyond what we can do in our own strength. But if it's what we can do in our own strength, it's not a miracle. And we want to see some miracles, don't we? We want to see God move because there's such despair and hopelessness and worthlessness in our society right now. People need to know that there is a church and a God that cares and that wants to make a difference and that they're not just some people, but that we consider them to be our people and God's people. Sometimes we want to quit. Sometimes it gets hard. Again, I was listening to uh, John Wimber and he was saying that he was reading from the book of Luke and he was doing a series of studies on the book of Luke and he kept leaving out the bits about healing and miracles because it just wasn't happening in his experience. And God said, you've got to preach it. You've got to start and pray it. You've got to start and do it. Well, he did. And for 12 months, nobody was healed. People left the church. People were disgruntled. But then God began to move in a mighty, mighty way. One of the first was a lady and she came for prayer because she got really bad arthritis. So he starts praying for her for this bad arthritis and God touches her. But she was also visually impaired and God didn't do anything about the arthritis, but he did heal her eyes. And one of the uh, the prayer team, he was just so shocked. He ran outside and threw up. But the climate changed. The time had come and He'd been ranting and raving against God. He said, this isn't fair. You've told me to do this. And God just said, the problem's not on my end. And sometimes we go through a process and we go through a time and we just have to trust God for the timing. We forget sometimes that these were real people. Mordecai probably had a wife and a family and aged parents. And Esther had hopes and dreams, but they surrendered it. They surrendered it to the time, to the plans, to the purposes of God. Sometimes a quiet life is overrated. Sometimes it's very tempting to say, I'm all right. Sometimes it's very tempting to stay in the shadows. But sometimes God calls us. Are we willing to take the challenge? Are we willing to walk step by step with him? Are we willing to make a difference and say, for such a time as this. Sometimes we can look back over our life. Sometimes we can look back over our testimony and see that God has been preparing us and that he has done things in the past that are leading us up. Have you got things that you know that God is preparing you for? Do you know what he's teaching you for? What he's strengthening you for? What those dreams are about? The dreams that you have and the heart that you have are not by chance. He is a good and he is a faithful God. Sometimes we put things down, we try for a while and we get discouraged. Maybe it's time for you to pick things up again. Maybe it's time for you to stick your neck out again. Maybe it's time to believe God again. Maybe it's time to have some courage. Disappointment and failure, insignificance, powerlessness, it's not about us. It's about being faithful to a faithful God. I just pray that you hear God's direction, that you grow in that maturity of knowing his timing, knowing his wisdom, knowing his way, but more than anything, that your love and your trust and your desire for him just grows. Because one of the reasons that I have stuck with the plan of God is because I just love his voice and I just love his presence and I want to be right in the middle of where he is and what he's doing. There has been there was a particular time I wanted to quit and I said, what am I doing this for? 
And I began to smell the fragrance of the presence of God. And there's been other times I've felt his nearness and I've felt his breeze and I've felt his breath. And I just so want to be in the presence and the plan of God. And that and my love for the people that need him, that's it. That's the motivation. If we just want to clean things up, to look good, to tidy things up, we'll play it safe. But a quiet life is overrated. The timing of God is always good. God bless. Go for it. Amen.